Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Let's seek the truth and travel the long road to justice together. What you know, alibiers? Welcome to another episode of Pretty Lies and Alibis. I'm Gigi. Good to have you here on this Friday. Hope you're ready for the weekend. I am. I'm going to tear my tree down and chill out a bit. If you're watching on YouTube, you're probably like, is Gigi wearing PJs in this episode? Yes, I am. I'd posted a few weeks ago that I found some Fleetwood Mac PJs I was going to buy. My mom said, wait, let me get them for Christmas. So I just got these and somebody said you should wear them on an episode. So here you go. They're very comfy, super cute. Cannot wait to go see Stevie Nicks in February, just five minutes from my house. The last time I saw her with my girls, we had to drive over four hours. If you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to hit the subscribe button, like the video, share it with your friends. I appreciate you. Music fact of the day, the song, I Can't Get No Satisfaction by the Rolling Stones. The riff for that actually came to Keith Richards in a dream. He woke up just long enough to record it, but he forgot to turn the recorder off. The riff is followed by 40 minutes of him snoring. We're going to jump into Lori Vallow. Prosecutors in Maricopa County, Arizona, have asked for more time to have Lori's trial. It's currently set for April 4th of next year. Her fifth husband, Chad Daybell, and her co-conspirator is set to start on April 1st, just three days before her trial is set in Arizona. His trial is expected to last at least until the end of May. It's a death penalty case. Lori's was not. So a few more weeks added to his trial. And at her arraignment earlier in the month, the state did ask for more time due to the complexity of the cases. They also cite the fact that victims in the case, Brandon Boudreaux, who is Lori's ex-nephew-in-law and nearly was killed by Alex Cox, only by inches did he miss, thank goodness, is going to be testifying in Chad's trial as he did in Lori's. And also, Kay and Larry Woodcock are statutory victims. Kay is the sister to Charles Vallow, who was shot and killed by Alex Cox, Lori's brother. Larry Woodcock, being the brother-in-law to Charles, will be present at Chad's trial and also will want to be present at Lori's. So I think they'll definitely reset this trial to a later date. They also say there's 20 terabytes of evidence to pour through. Arizona law says that Lori must be tried within 270 days of her arraignment. The latter end of that would fall on September 2nd. The filing also says the state will need to call out-of-state witnesses to testify in both cases. The murder of Charles Vallow and the attempted murder of Brandon Boudreaux was also investigated by the FBI and the Rexburg PD. It really kicked into high gear once the kids were considered missing and then Tammy Daybell's death looked suspicious and they started saying, whoa, Charles Vallow shot and killed, initially ruled a self-defense, thank goodness. We now have some charges for his death. Alex Cox died the day after they exhumed Tammy Daybell's body for autopsy. I will die on the hill. It was not natural, but it was ruled natural. Also, multiple experts between the two cases are expected to be called. Those include a medical examiner, a firearms expert, cell phone expert, DNA experts, gunshot residue experts, as well as multiple police officers, civilians, and victims. They also say that since Lori is already serving a life sentence without parole in Idaho, there's no prejudice by waiting until the last days of that 270-day mark. So we'll keep you updated. I'm pretty sure this will be granted and that trial will be pushed out since these cases are all so intertwined. We're going to move on to the murders of 18-year-old Savannah Soto, her unborn child, which was full term, and her 22-year-old boyfriend, Matthew Guerra. Savannah was reported missing after failing to show up for a scheduled induction. She was last seen on December 22nd in Leon Valley, which is a city about 10 miles from downtown San Antonio. She was actually a week overdue with the pregnancy. The missing person report was filed that day on the 23rd, and their bodies were found on December 27th in a car in a parking lot. When her mom didn't hear from her on the day of her scheduled induction, she went by her apartment and knocked with no answer. She called the hospital and they informed her that Savannah never showed up. Officials in San Antonio issued a care alert, which was sent out to help locate 
and rescue missing, kidnapped, or abducted adults who are in immediate danger of injury or death. The family was alerted to a vehicle that matched the description of the one they were last seen in at an apartment complex in San Antonio on December 28th. Savannah's sister-in-law went to where the car was located, opened the car door, found the two of them dead. It was then called into police. Savannah and Matthew both have been shot in the head. They estimate that Savannah, Matthew, and the baby likely have been deceased for three to four days before their bodies were found. EMS pronounced them dead on the scene, and the vehicle had actually been in that location for several days. Police have released a surveillance video that showed two persons of interest in the case. Two cars meet up in a parking lot, one of those being a dark Chevy Silverado, the other being Matthew's Kia Optima. The driver of the truck hands something to the driver of the Kia. Police believe the object was something to wipe the side of the car down with. The video was also taken near where the bodies were found. Investigators are looking into cell phone data, social media posts, and surveillance to try to find out what led to these murders. The medical examiner found that Matthew and Savannah had been shot in the head, Matthew's wound was a contact wound, meaning the muzzle of the gun touched his skin. Cops say it's a very, very perplexing crime scene, and investigators are combing through days of surveillance videos from several locations where the victims were known to be and are hopeful that the videos will shed light on the circumstances leading up to the murders. They're also looking to see who they last communicated with, all the standard things they do. This is one of those cases that is taking off on social media, and with that comes a lot of rumor and speculation, which is a big thorn in my side. Aside from that, we're starting to see kind of what happened in the Idaho murders case, where people are throwing up pictures of people that they think are suspects. Such a dangerous thing to do. They'll find the suspects and, you know, to post people's personal information just on a hunch, super reckless and can be a danger to them. The case is being investigated as a capital murder case, and tragedy, unfortunately, is nothing new to Savannah's family. Her 15-year-old brother, Ethan Soto, was shot and killed just last May after leaving his house to meet someone. An argument ensued, and two teenagers were arrested shortly after the murder. The murder was allegedly over some stolen THC cartridges. Before the murder, the suspect, Victor Rivas shut up the family home. Nobody was injured. Ethan's mother actually met up with Victor to try to pay for the cartridges just to settle all this. He would not agree to that. He said he was looking for the person who robbed him and wanted to catch him when he saw him. The suspect asked a female over Instagram to lure Ethan by setting up a drug deal involving the stolen cartridges. And this is when he was ambushed and killed. During his preliminary hearing, Victor made a gesture towards the Soto family, and the Soto family just decided to jump the barrier and gave this kid a beat down. That's on the video here. Before her daughter's remains were found, her mom told KSAT that she was super excited to have this baby. The house was ready, and there was no reason why she would just get up and go and not let anybody know where she was going. Savannah's grandmother, Rachel Soto, described her as a funny girl. She loved everybody and loved to live life. She was looking forward to becoming a mom for the first time. Her mom added that Savannah knows what I went through with Ethan, and I know she doesn't want me to go through this again. If anybody has any information, police urge you to contact Homicide at 210-207-7635. You can remain anonymous. Hopefully, there'll be a break in this case soon. Just a little brief update. The house where Ethan, Zana, Kaylee, and Maddie were killed last year was demolished yesterday. I don't think I've ever seen a house get demolished so quickly. They started a little early. Within an hour and a half, I think the house was totally down, and they had carted off most of the remains. We know family members expressed concerns about demolishing the house. Ultimately, it's over, and it's done. So I hope this brings some sense of peace to the families and all those who are affected and have to see the house. Gypsy Rose was released from prison yesterday after serving 85% of her 10-year sentence. Gypsy's mother, Dee Dee, was murdered by Gypsy's boyfriend, Nicholas Godijohn, after he traveled from his home in Wisconsin to Springfield, Missouri, where Gypsy and her mom live. Just a little backstory, there are a million documentaries out there on this case you can watch. They're all so disturbing, and this case has really haunted me since it hit the news. Gypsy's mom, Dee Dee, began claiming that Gypsy had medical problems not long after she was born in 1991. 
The first ailment she allegedly had was like sleep apnea, where she would stop breathing. Dee Dee and Gypsy's father were married, divorced very quickly. Gypsy and Dee Dee moved to Springfield, Missouri after Hurricane Katrina in September of 2005. After they moved, Dee Dee claimed that a lot of Gypsy's medical records were destroyed in the hurricane. She amped up all the different conditions that she claimed her daughter had. And since there was no family in the area, there was nobody to question it. At that point, Dee Dee had alienated Gypsy and her dad from each other. Dee Dee, to everybody, just seemed to be this devoted and doting mother. So people really didn't question any of the conditions that Dee Dee claimed that Gypsy had. Dee Dee loved the attention, and there was also a big financial incentive for her to lie about her daughter being sick. They had a house built for them by Habitat for Humanity. And at doctor's appointments, Gypsy was told to play with her Barbies. Her mom did all the talking. And Dee Dee would tell people that Gypsy had the mental capacity of a seven-year-old. Gypsy even had a feeding tube inserted. She would give Gypsy medications through that feeding tube. Some of those medications caused her teeth to rot out. They had to be pulled. Gypsy was subjected to a lot of unnecessary medical procedures, such as a feeding tube being inserted. She had her salivary glands removed and eye surgeries and just all kinds of crazy stuff. The community in Missouri just rallied around Dee Dee and Gypsy. There were charity events, donations, sponsoring for trips, including to Disney World and these medical trips. Between 2007 and 2009, several doctors expressed concerns about Gypsy. And one neurologist that Gypsy visited when she was 14 documented this was likely a case of Munchausen by proxy. It's a mental disorder where a caregiver or a parent will make up or exaggerate symptoms that the person they're caring for has. In order to gain sympathy, they kind of bask in the attention. And for Dee Dee, there was clearly a financial motive. Dee Dee didn't work and claimed her full-time job was taking care of Gypsy. The report came after neurological tests and physical exams showed there were no medical issues with Gypsy, that everything looked normal. The same doctor noted that for a child who had not walked in years, she seemingly had normal muscle tone in her legs. He did not report this to authorities, though. He documented it, but he said he didn't think there was enough evidence for authorities to act. He's interviewed on the HBO documentary about her case. In 2009, there was an anonymous report made saying that there was no medical basis for Gypsy's supposed medical conditions. Two caseworkers visited the home. Dee Dee convinced them that she was really sick, and that was that. But when Gypsy became a teenager... Dee Dee started to alter her birth certificates to reflect Gypsy being younger than she was. I mean, Gypsy looks really young for her age, even now in her 30s. Gypsy's hormones were starting to kick in, as they do most teenagers. And Dee Dee was starting to lose a little bit of control over Gypsy. In 2011, Gypsy ran away with a man that she met at a sci-fi convention. However, Dee Dee tracked him down through a mutual friend, convinced the man that Gypsy was underage, and she was 19 at the time, by the way. Gypsy claims after that, Dee Dee bashed in her computer and her cell phone, physically restrained her when they got home. Gypsy also claimed later that Dee Dee would hit her and deny her food. When Gypsy was able to get back online, she joined a Christian dating website. That's where she met her boyfriend, Nicholas. They had an online relationship. Gypsy convinced him to come kill Dee Dee. She admitted to Nicholas that she really wasn't sick. And she also said that killing Dee Dee was the only way they could be together. Of course, Dee Dee did not like the fact that Gypsy was seeing this young man. So in June of 2015, he traveled to Springfield from his home in Wisconsin and stabbed Dee Dee to death. Gypsy was in the bathroom the entire time with her ears covered. After the murder, the two had sex and they left. They called a cab and took some buses back to Wisconsin to where Nicholas lived. News of Dee Dee's murder spread in the community, and people were worried that Gypsy had been abducted or killed. But after the murder, Gypsy posted on a Facebook account that she shared with her mom posing as the killer, saying that the bee was dead. Other disturbing posts indicated that Gypsy had been sexually assaulted and slashed. Gypsy later told authorities she made the posts hoping that her mother's body would be found sooner. They took thousands of dollars from the house, Gypsy packed disguises. They're seen on surveillance, going to hotels, at bus stations, things of that nature. Ultimately, Gypsy and her boyfriend were found at his home and taken into custody after a brief standoff. Now, Gypsy pled guilty and received a 10-year sentence. 
Nicholas took it to trial. His attorneys argued he was on the autism spectrum and he was manipulated by Gypsy to kill her mother. Gypsy was actually called as a defense witness as trial. She took responsibility on the stand for persuading him to kill Dee Dee. Ultimately, he was sentenced to life in prison. Now, since their stay in prison, Gypsy, who is now 32, has given a lot of interviews. And in one, she said she didn't realize how healthy she was until after she was arrested. She was engaged to one man for a while, but they broke up. But ultimately, she ended up marrying a man named Ryan Anderson. He is a special education teacher in Louisiana, and they started communicating after he sent a letter in 2020. He said back when Tiger King was really popular on Netflix, a friend of his said he wanted to send a letter to Joe Exotic. Ryan said, if you do, I'll send a letter to Gypsy Rose. He said he never thought that she would end up being his wife. They were married on June 27th, 2022 at the prison. Gypsy says, Ryan has seen me through some really good times, some really hard times. I would say he's probably the most compassionate soul that I've ever met and the most patient. God knows he's so patient with me because I could be a lot to handle. I could be an emotional handful. We're in love, but also it's hard because I know I'm going into a new life and I'm newly married. I'm going to have kids one day and I'm going to have to explain to my kids why their grandmother on mommy's side isn't around. And that's going to be a really hard conversation. While she was incarcerated, Gypsy has had therapy over the years and she is still receiving that therapy. She says she has no worries about repeating her mother's actions with her own children. Gypsy, her husband, and her family, her dad, her stepmom, who have welcomed her back with open arms, seem to really have her best interest at heart. They're going to be featured on a six-hour Lifetime docuseries called The Prison Confessions of Gypsy Rose. That airs on January 5th, 6th, and 7th at 8 p.m. on Lifetime. In other news, Jody Hildebrandt, the co-conspirator with Ruby Frankie, pleaded guilty to all charges. The guilty plea on paper is pretty much exactly the same as Ruby's, and we went over that, I think, last week on an episode. Jody and Ruby both have sentencing set for February 20th. We're going to tune into that, bring you the updates. Really hope they get the maximum sentence to both of them. Lastly, we're going to talk about Alec Murdaugh. The Moselle property is going up for auction online. That's going to be happening in February. The bidding is starting at $1.1 million. The listing says the house is 5,275 square feet with four bedrooms and four and a half baths. It says it's exceptional for hosting and a unique property that has the capacity to offer the buyer many potential uses, such as a family residence or compound, a hobby or a farm, or just a weekend retreat destination. They don't mention in there that two people were brutally murdered on the property. I don't know about you guys. Let me know in the comments. Could you live in a house where people were brutally murdered? Nope, I could not. There's no way I could. What's interesting is the house actually sold for $2.6 million in March. By the way, Alec has a preliminary hearing scheduled for January 15th. I'm going to make my way down for that. Then that three-day evidentiary hearing regarding the jury tampering allegations with Clerk of Court Becky Hill set for January 29th, and it's expected to run through the 31st. I'll be there for that as well doing some live updates and things like that. So that's it for today. Appreciate all the new listeners. You guys are amazing. We have a really cool community here. A lot of really positive conversations back and forth. We don't do speculation and rumor. It's just detrimental to cases. It hurts families and has no place in true crime. So if you want all the facts, come here because that's what we do. Hope you guys have a good rest of your evening. We'll see you soon. 